Hello, my name is Mike, and these are some bikes. These are two small models of the Victory V92C, which was their first introductory model. Um, this one's even like commemorative. V92C, July 4th, 1998, production number 0001. But I have some real motorcycles, not just little model toys. I've got a garage full of stupid things. Anyway, this episode, we're going to pick up where the last episode left off. We got it to pop, so we know that the ignition system is working, but we don't get fuel to the uh, cylinder, so we're pretty sure we got plugged injectors, and of course, the rest of the fuel system is just absolutely full of schmutz and crud and rust, and it's, it just it needs some TLC. Tremendous torture is what it needs. So we're going we're gonna to torture the inside of that gas tank, and we're going to get rid of all the schmutz that we possibly can, put some new filtration in it, and then uh, we'll get it fired up, and we'll take it for a little spin, if we're successful. That is, if there is no serious electrical issue, like the previous owner seemed to think that there was. So anyway, stick around. Somewhere in a dusty, dirty back alley in western Arizona, not far from historic Route 66, is an old fart trying to cram a square peg into a round hole. He'll work on anything, just as long as it's got at least two cool wheels. realize is there's actually a little screen or filter inside this tube. To get to them we got to take the hoses off. Uh, screens are kind of hard to find. A lot of times people leave them out. Uh, you can hunt them down online. I'll, I'll post the part number in the video. And if you can't find those you can also get some just small brass screen and just you know shove it in the holes. I've done that in the past. Just so there's something there to keep you know larger particles from getting into the pump. Once it gets past the pump, of course, then it goes to a filter before it reaches the fuel injectors. Now, in this particular case, the screens are no longer there. Somebody's taken them out in the past. Those hoses were rotted. I'm going to reuse the T that came with it, but we're still going to use a quick disconnect, uh, and we'll attach it to the end of this T. So, saving those. After we get done cleaning the tank out, we'll go ahead and put some screens back in here where they belong. So here's here's what they look like, and they're you can see they're just the diameter to fit in the tube, and they're fairly flexible because of course the, the tube has a curve to it. You just kind of jam them on in there. When these things get old and, and kind of dry out, they're not nearly as flexible. You may have to fight them to get them out. I've even had someone had to kind of cut them and drill them to get them out on the older bikes. Um, but the new ones are nice and flexible. If you can find them, they are once again an obsolete part number. But there's your part number again. 2530031 if you can find them. They come up on eBay every now and again. And like I said, you can just use a piece of, you can get brass screen pretty cheap, just in bulk, and, and just wrap it around a pencil to make you know, kind of a cone shape and just stuff it in there, just, just to keep the big chunks out. Uh, we're going to take the tank sending unit out of here. It's probably really crusty. We'll probably have to clean up the contacts on it so it works. Now, if for some reason your float is saturated or crumbles or swollen or is bad because the floats do go bad with time, interestingly enough, turns out that a float from a Model A will actually work. You kind of have to force it onto the shaft a little bit, and, uh, and sometimes they interfere and rub against the side, so check for clearances, but they will work. So this is the float from a Model A. And there's your Ford part number. It is an A9313 Charlie. And that's just this, you know, compressed foam stuff. Like I said, I think the end of the shaft is it, it just slightly different diameter or something, if I recall. 
Anyway, but these will work. There we go. And uh, not too crusty, a little crusty. So you see this float's a little smaller diameter than that Model A float. This one looks pretty rough. I'm going to go ahead and replace it while I got this apart. I'm going to want to get in there and, and clean out those contacts. So I'll put an ohmmeter on it and I'll work this back and forth. It's really stiff. But, uh, so I'm pretty sure we can resurrect this. They're just you know, it's a variable resistor in there. We'll just clean that out real good. And the tank is just, yeah, yuck. Horrible stuff. We're going to get a little muriatic acid, flush it out with that. And then I'll get some uh, screws or bolts and put them in there and shake it around like a giant, uh, uh, what do you call it, castanet. Try and break up any debris. We'll flush it a couple of gazillion times and see if we can't get it clean enough to hold fuel. That's our next, uh, next task. I have the sending unit soaking in some barramins, and you can see the kind of brown stuff just kind of leaching out of it. Uh, hopefully that'll free it up. I, I took a meter to it, and it was kind of erratic. It was making contact at times, but at other times not. So all that gunk's got to get out of there. So we'll, we'll let that soak for a while. And right now I have the tank soaking with a little bit of vinegar in it. I figure vinegar is a little bit safer than muriatic acid, and we'll just see how far that takes us. So I dumped this entire gallon of vinegar in the tank, and granted it's not as strong as muriatic acid, but when you use muriatic acid, they tell you to dilute it. I'm not sure if, how effective vinegar will be compared to muriatic acid. We'll, we'll slosh it around. Um, what I did see is the previous owner said that he thought that this thing had a liner put in it, and sure enough in the opening for the uh, tank sending unit, I could see that there was some liner, but it's all coming off in big chunks. So that's going to provide a little bit of a challenge because, well, we've got to get those chunks out of there. So I'm going to go ahead and drain this uh, vinegar out. Hopefully it helped loosen some stuff. I'm going to put a fistful of drywall screws in there and, and shake it around for a while, maybe a few nuts and bolts, and just want things that can tumble around in the tank and act like a tumbler and break up anything that's clinging to the sides so it's more easy to remove. So that's the next step. Now that the tank uh, has had a chance to dry, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put a bunch of real small sheet metal screws. Typically I like to use uh, the real short deck screws or drywall screws. The idea being that the little pointy ends will act as an abrasive and kind of scrub the inside. Now in this particular case, I don't know if you can see it too well, there's there's a liner in there that's coming apart. So we've got some pretty big chunks in there that have to be broken loose. So I'm also going to put in some nuts and bolts, some larger, heavier objects. And then we're just going to shake the heck out of this gas tank. We want to torture the inside surface. These lug nuts ought to do. They'll act like little hammers and they'll help chip away that loose liner. Here we go. Still stinks. Shake, shake, shake. Shake, shake, shake. Shake your gas tank. Shake your gas tank. I can see the chunks coming loose in there already. Oh yeah. It's a nasty one. All right, after vigorously shaking till my arms are sore, we're gonna go in there and retrieve all those metal objects we dropped in here using a magnet. Work with me, magnet. And there's, there's a lot of stuff in there. Oh look, I got one. I may be here a while. Look at all 
of debris. There's there's chunks of something there. That's the old liner coming out. So that's good. We're getting it all loose so we won't plug up our fuel system. Look at the dog. Larry? Silly dog. He wants to come out here with his dad. Now you guys stay in there. I take it back. That's that's actually rust because you'll notice it's well it's sticking to my magnet, so it has some metal to it. It is not a liner. That just shows how rusty it was inside. All that stuff's coming loose. Well, I was able to flush most of the junk out of the tank. We got all the bolts and stuff back out, but there's still some stuff floating around in there. And so what I've done is I've kind of cobbled together a vacuum cleaner attachment. We'll suck the last little bit of stuff out of there. But at least we know all the loose stuff is not going to plug up the filter screens. We'll put a new float on the sending unit, and we'll put some screens into those intake tubes. Alright, the sending unit has sat and it's soaked and most of the schmutzy stuff is out of there. So we just want to make sure that this variable resistor, which is what it is, the resistance changes depending on float level and that will tell our gauge unit how much fuel we have. So uh, what I've put together is a real simple rig. This wire here is my negative or ground wire coming off the battery and it's just attached to the to the mounting plate. The mounting plate right there is grounded by a stud so that's the negative side of it. And then the yellow wire here which the other alligator clip goes to is the one that goes up to your gauge. So what it's measuring is the resistance to ground. The greater the resistance to ground the lower the fuel you have. The higher the less resistance to ground the higher the fluid is or the fuel is. And so what I've done is this this wire clip to it here, this goes to my test light. So the positive terminal of the battery goes to one end of the test light, and then the back end of my test light is going through that variable resistor back to ground. So as I raise this float arm, you can see the test light respond. Or not. Okay, so now when it's really full, it's on real bright, but as the float goes down, it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So you can see the float is working not real not real well. If I wiggle it it goes on and off but it is reading somewhat. So as time goes on the you know the little bit of crud that's still on that variable resistor will wear off and eventually it'll I don't know. It's probably usable I just it's not a gauge I would trust real good right now. I'll keep cleaning it see if I can't get it to be more consistent but at least it's doing something now. All right, we're ready to maneuver the tank sending unit back into place. Now when this is installed, the actual float's going to be in this area here. And because this float's a little bit bigger diameter, it may you know, rub against the sides, it may inhibit it from moving freely. So once I get it in, I'm going to turn the tank right side up and upside down and make sure that the float arm can move. It's not binding up. If it is, I may have to pull it back out and just bend this arm a little bit one way or the other to obtain some clearance.
Okay, now that the screens are in, I'm going to go ahead and put my feed hoses on the hose nipples. Um, when you go to put these on, I use 3 8 hose, 3 8 fuel, which is fairly common. These are actually slightly larger. They're 47 or whatever freaking size it is. Anyway, so I put just a little bit of assembly lube on there, which is basically Vaseline, called Transgel. And that will help me lubricate it to, to get it to slide over and on and into place. Um, and then once you get these things put together, you get them in a, a lineup where they need to be. Uh, and again, I, th I think I covered this in a previous video. When I go to connect the T to the quick release fitting, I cut a little bit off of each one to make this as short as possible. You really don't have a lot of room in the area. Make sure you measure it. And this usually lines up with, with the bolt hole thereabouts. So that hose should just be about the right length. And then uh, we're still waiting on this fitting. Once we get this fitting, we'll be able to put the gas tank back on. Uh, I can't do this one-handed. Uh. We're going to come over here and we're going to remove the coffin type air cleaner assembly. You guys have seen me do this before. There's a small panel you can take off off the top here. A couple of snorkels that come out. And then in order to remove this from between the frame rails, you got to cut it out. The only way to get out in one piece is to completely remove the engine, which we're not going to do. So I, the method I like, you can use a, a jigsaw or hammer and chisel or baseball bat, whatever you want to use. I prefer to use the hot knife method. I just got an old beat up butter knife. I get it red hot and then I can just cut through the plastic like a knife cutting through butter. Then we can cut it up into fragments and work it out of there, get it out of there. Now in the past, I've kind of tried to preserve the back half of it, this, this section here. And I preserve this section because I can put a plate on the front and I can use a cone type filter and then I have an easily removable air filter assembly that is actually more efficient as far as airflow goes because there's more surface area. However, I got fairly lucky and found an actual 1999 model year cone type air cleaner assembly on eBay. I got it really, really cheap because, well, that's how I am. And then uh, we'll use this. And that means I don't have to be nice to this one because we're not going to use any of it. It's all... It's all going in the trash. Some of you might say, why would you throw away a perfectly good intake air box air cleaner? I've got a shelf full of these things. I got them from all the other bikes I did. The ones where I actually had to take the engine out to repair it, I, you know, I saved the old ones. So if for some weird reason, I decide in the future that I want to put a cumbersome type air cleaner assembly in here that blocks access to the engine and the throttle body and the injectors, I can always put one back in. Not likely to happen, but that possibility is is still there. Anyway, so we'll just cut that sucker out. And, oops, hit my tripod. We'll cut that sucker out. That'll give me access to the fuel injectors. I've got a couple of known good fuel injectors. We'll put those in, and we should be able to actually fire this thing up with a little bit of gasoline. And uh, hopefully those fittings will arrive here in the next day or two. And we can put the fittings on the tank, put the tank back on it, and make an actually rideable bike out of this thing.
Now, the injectors have changed a little over the years. These ones are gray in color. What's the part number on these? These have a Bosch part number of 0289, uh, 156, 04, I can't read it, I don't know if it's 040, 046. So these are the OE ones. And then they change slightly. The replacement ones, which work just, just fine, I don't notice any difference in performance. And that's these black ones. And their part number is um, 280156140. So, and again, these, these get used in multiple years. They've changed a few times. The Bosch injectors, the nice thing about these is if, if you go by the Bosch number, you don't necessarily have to look them up as a victory part because they're used for cars and all kinds of stuff. The flow rate's going to vary, so again, you want to use a number that is compatible, but you can go by a Bosch number instead of a victory number. Anyway, these are known good ones, so we're going to put these ones in. that people ask me a lot is if you look over here the pressure regulator it's got this vacuum nipple on it nothing goes to that just leave it open it doesn't do anything you don't have to plug it, it really doesn't do anything it's just you know ambient air pressure on the back side of the diaphragm is all it is Now if you are fortunate enough to come across one of the 99 model year uh, cone type air cleaners because it's a little bit different shape back here you need some really long bolts. Uh, these are M6 by 105 and M6 by uh, 110. Good luck finding them. Uh, most hardware stores won't carry them. You usually have to order them online. But anyway we're going to go ahead and install this and we'll hook up a temporary fuel source and we'll fire it up, see if those injectors are doing their job properly. Now this presents a new problem. Something I may have mentioned before, when you go to the cone type filter, some of the earlier air boxes, the connector for the mass airflow sensor doesn't reach. So you'll have to extend this wire harness. Just cut and splice and extend it so that it reach that location.
Now there's two reasons to stagger the length of the wires. You'll notice when I cut the connector off, I staggered them. Number one, it's not so bulky when you go to tape it up. And number two, once you make your initial connections, it's kind of hard to connect them to the wrong wire at this end because they're different lengths. So you'll notice two of my wires are similar color. This one's like a purple and orange, and this one's a brown and orange, but at a glance they look the same. It's easy to swap them. So by staggering them, well, it kind of forces me to connect them properly. So that way when you go to get your wires to extend it, the color codes don't necessarily have to match. portable temporary surrogate fuel tank here. I've got it connected to the suction side here so the fuel pump can draw fuel out of it and then my return line goes back into it just like it would a regular tank. Put a little petrol in here and we'll see if the uh, fuel grill will fire up and if our fuel injectors are uh, going to solve the problem. We know we have spark. We know our fuel pump works. If this doesn't solve the problem, then we may have an electrical problem with the ECU or something of that nature. So, okay. All right, we're priming. And then we see the fuel being returned here. Uh, yeah, it's kind of dark fuel. Some of that schmutz is still in there. Well, we've got the tank about as ready as we can get it. Hopefully the cinder will work somewhat. We've got our feed system put into place. We'll go ahead and throw the tank back on the old girl, fire it up, and maybe take her for a little spin. Well, the time has come. We're gonna take this old girl off for a spin under her own power.
there it is, guys. Got a bike nice and cheap because it needed some TLC. We did a little TLC on it. She's not perfect. She needs some stuff. Floorboard. The uh, display on the speedometer doesn't work. I've got one of those. I'll put it on it. Um, the rear turn signal is bent. It's got some rusty issues. But overall, she's a pretty nice bike. So that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Come on back for the next episode. And don't forget, you know, the usual. Like, subscribe, share. See you next time. And then uh, we'll get it fired up and we'll take it for a little spin if we're successful. If there's not some kind of serious electrical issue, like the previous owners thought that there was. Fucking phone. That is, if there is no serious electrical issue, like the previous owner seemed to think that there was.